Thank you so much. Thank you so much for the introduction. And I think I can share my screen. Can you see the screen now? Yes. Okay, so thank you so much for the introduction and for the invitation to contribute to this, to this seminar. And well, as you can see, uh, the title is Photomics Study of the Neuroprotective Potential of Olive Leaves by Product. But I have changed all the slides because I think uh, it was not uh, focused on the main topic, which is food authentication. So I have changed most of them. And I don't know if, if I will have time, but I can maybe go further than to this topic. So as you have already, or Marcos have already introduced, food authenticity is the study of food adulteration, mislabeling and fraud, either unintentional or deliberate, which is a worldwide and growing concern. And for that, we need accurate and reliable analytical methods, firstly, to monitor and control food authenticity, and secondly, to guarantee the correct and accurate labeling of food stuff. So in general, food authenticity deals with different topics, such as the species authentication, breed identification, proportion of ingredients, uh, technological processing, type of raw material, production method, additives, uh, determination of uh, genetically modified organisms, or the determination of the geographical origin. Many of you may have heard about several um, news like uh, saffron fraud, which, because saffron is the most expensive species in the world, or a scandal like uh, horse meat found in IKEA meatballs. But there is also a growing concern about genetically modified organisms and its conventional, the conventional counterparts, or the adulteration of wine in several countries with different grape varieties or, or different grapes from different uh, locations. And there was also a big uh, new in Spain in 1980, where rapeseed oil, uh, designed for cooking was mixed with engine oil which uh, and the people use it for cooking so a lot of people got poisoned and many of them died so this is uh, about food security but also food authenticity because these uh, two oils were mixed so uh, in this sense of mixed space massive molecular tools can help to think when uh, limitation of traditional methodologies as marcus has already introduced and in this, in, in 2009, uh, the Freedomics term was defined as a discipline that studies the food and nutrition domains through the application and integration of advanced omic technologies to improve consumers' well-being, health, and knowledge. Uh, this term was first de uh, defined by Professor Cifuentes, which is the head of my laboratory in several journals. And it involves, as you can see here in the figure, the food science and technology domain with nutrition and also the application of omic technologies such as genomics, transcriptomics. I will go further in these tools because are the most important part of my talk to determine or study the food authenticity, food traceability, food quality and security, and food bioactivity. This is my main topic, but here I have, as I explained, I have changed the talk. And together with this, uh, we have other tools which are very important, chemometrics and bioinformatics, and also uh, toxicity assays uh, using in vitro or in vivo models or clinical assays, all to improve consumer well-being, health and confidence through their diet. So here is more or less what uh, a big picture of foodomics, where do we have genomics and proteomics and transcriptomics and all the information or the massive information has to be handled with bioinformatic tools to acquire the data or to st store the data for the posterior an analysis and the interpretation, which is the most difficult part. And the integration of all these tools uh, will give us a, a holistic view of, like from a system biological perspective, having a whole of a system, not just one specific part. So firstly, transcriptomics. Uh, uh, is the study of all transcripts in a system. It involves the notation of mRNAs or non-coding RNAs, but also the determination of transcripts, uh, structure, the determination of splicing phenomena, and the quantification of transcripts in different conditions. This could be, um, for instance, comparing genetically modified organisms against conventional growing organisms. 
The main tools used in transcriptomics are real-time qPCR that most of you may know, but also in the last year, other tools have been developed, such as the loop-mediated isothermal amplification or the serial analysis of gene expression. This tool is more high throughput than the PCR, but from 2009, other tools emerged or methodologies or technologies such as the gene expression microarrays and the RNA sequencing. These tools, well, microarrays um, consist on a device, a solid device where a lot of oligonucleotides are placed in specific positions. And then the, the RNA is extracted from the sample we want to analyze, is reverse transcribed into cDNA, and this cDNA is labeled with biotin and hybridized into the chip. Then the next step is to wash the chip and to stain with different dyes so we can acquire the signals with different instruments. In the case of RNA sequence, uh, we have the same sample. We extract the RNA, but we ligate to RNA adapters. We then convert into cDNA and we construct a, libra a library. This library is then sequenced and it can be used to map into an already known genome to calculate the number of sequence we have, or it can be used to link to and to construct a new genome or transcriptome. These tools have uh, evolved in the last years and have revolutionized many fields such as the food nutrition, and many crops have already been sequenced. There are several or a number of uh, next generation sequencing platforms which use different chemistries, and the most known are Illumina and Thermo Fisher, but there are also other vendors which have different sequencers. All of them are characterized by mainly by the maximum read length, is the number, the, the length of the transcript that can be read, and also this, the maximum sequence yield per run. So all this combination can give or give us the coverage, a different coverage uh, of the genome or the transcriptome, and it takes more or less time depending on the on the technique. In addition, this, this RNA or transcriptomic techniques have different advantages and disadvantages. In the case of RNA seq and microarray, you can uh, analyze the whole transcriptome in a single assay. And in the case of RNA seq, there is no previous knowledge of, of the genome. Which you can construct a new genome based on the, on the transcript you obtain. Uh, in the case of real-time PCR, it has a high specificity and sensitivity. It allows the absolute and relative quantification and is quite simple. You just need uh, two primers, DNA, DNTPs, and tag polymerase. However, the problem is that you cannot apply it for, uh, to analyze a, a high number of genes, which is the opposite to RNA, seq, and microarrays. However, these two newest technologies are still quite expensive and it takes quite some time to sequence the data or to sequence the, the genome or the transcriptome. And also it only allows, well, and the data uh, acquisition and storage and data processing, it takes uh, some time. So there are some advantages and disadvantages in both of them. Uh, together with these tools, the mm, different mm, softwares have, de have been developed that allow the design of the microarrays or to subtract, subtract noise, to group signals, to normalize the signals, to, read, uh, the, uh, to, to do the alignment of the reads and count them, and also to perform statistical analysis. Together, there are also several databases. The biggest one is the one from the NCBI, which in June, of 2017 had more than 260 gigabases of DNA sequence. Uh, in addition, there are several consortiums that have been created, such as the International Nucleotide Sequence Database Collaboration, which involves the DNA Data Bank of Japan, the National Center for Biotechnology, and the European Nucleotide Archive. And this service uh, has a massive amount of, of data more than eight petabases of open access DNA sequence from more than 84,000 species. So it's huge. In addition, together with these with this databases, there are other resources such as the RNA Central, uh, Central uh, which have up-to-date 
data set of non-coding RNA sequences or the GMO applicants database from the European Commission with more than 240,000 in silico generated applicants for genetically modified organisms. In addition, there is another big one with half million DNA barcodes uh, for different species. Secondly, we have proteomics, which aims to the, uh, the study of the identification of proteins and their quantification, but also the determination of the protein structure, the conformation, the location, the splicing phenomena, or the post-relational modification. And it also allows the relation between the transcript, the transcript levels and the protein levels to can correlate. This is a typical workflow for uh, used in proteomics. Once you select the sample you want to analyze, you need first to extract the proteins, and then these proteins can be analyzed following different approaches. The, I will go further in details in the next slides, but proteins can be digested or they can be analyzed in their intact form with different separation methods. And then usually mass spectrometry is the, the analytical tool used for the identification for the analysis. The most used uh, mass spectrometry approaches are based on the soft ionization techniques, such as electrospray ionization and matrix or MALDI, matrix assisted laser dis desorption ionization which allow the, pr the proteins or peptides go into the mass spectrometer and to measure the MS, the exact mass, and the MSMS -MS spectra, which can be further used for the, the identification of these proteins. There are two main approaches in the proteomics. The first one is the top-down, and the second is the bottom-up. In the case of the top-down, uh, it consists on the analysis of the intact protein. So these proteins are firstly separated using two-dimensional gel, gel electrophoresis or liquid chromatography. <clears throat> and then the samples are uh, introduced into the MS to get the MS and MSMS -MS spectra. In the case of the bottom-up, instead of using the, uh, analyzing the intact protein, we analyze the peptides. And these peptides can be obtained through different approaches. First, proteins can be separated using two-dimensional uh, electrophoresis and then the spots can be um, obtained and digest into peptides and the peptides analyzed uh, by MS or all the proteins, the mixture of proteins can be in, solu in solution digested and we would obtain a, a whole mixture of peptides that need to be separated first and then introduced into the mass spec. In the case of this shotgun approach, the peptide sequencing is the, the analysis of these peptides to try to identify the sequence. And after the analysis or the separation, mainly by HPLC, the MS and MSMS -MS spectra obtained is com are compared to theoretical fragmentation spectra. These spectra are obtained from the proteomic databases, which contain the sequence of all proteins. And these proteins can be in silico digested impossible peptides using maybe trypsin. So you will have a possible peptide. And also this can be in silico fragmented to get different spectra. So the combination of the theoretical spectra and the experimental spectra can give us the identity of the, of the peptide and then to go back and reconstruct the protein. For this, we need also several bioinformatic tools first to do the peak extraction of the ions in the MS, but also for the identification, quantification, determination of modifications, and statistical analysis. As well as for transcriptomics, there are several uh, databases or proteomics databases, being the NCBI or RefSec, the biggest one, but also Uniprot and EMBL databases, the biggest ones. These databases contain information of the sequence of the, of the protein, the structure, the protein processing, and many of them can link to other uh, DNA or RNA databases. So you can go back and forth between both uh, databases. One of the main um, bottlenecks is the analysis of the, um, or the interpretation of the spectra. So a lot of or several search engines have been developed. The most known are Mascot and Sequest, 
but also Andromeda was developed by the Max Planck Institute or the Max, Max Planck Institute to compare the experimental with the data uh, in, uh, collected in the databases. But there are also some tools to try to, uh, to do the de novo sequencing without having information of the peptides in those databases. In addition, there are several uh, quantification methods that can be, or approaches that can be used, either label-based with different uh, isotopes or uh, using metabol metabolic or chemical isotopes, and also label-free where you don't have, you don't, do not compare at the same time two samples, but just to spectral counting, for instance. And finally, we have metabolomics, which is the low molecular weight uh, the analysis of low molecular weight molecules. And this can be divided in four different approaches. Like firstly, the target analysis is to target one or some specific metabolites and try to quantify them. A metabolomic profiling, which is the analysis of a, 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 um, a set of compounds that are related in their nature. The metabolomic fingerprint or the analysis of as much metabolites as possible or the metabolic flux to try to follow um, a specific metabolite through different biochemical reactions. However, there are some considerations when dealing with uh, metabolomics. And as you can see in the figure, the chemical complexity of the metabolome is huge. It, 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 it is believed that more than 2 million chemicals exist. And compared to proteomics, which is based on 20 amino acids, or genomics, which is based on four bases, the complexity is uh, much bigger. So this diversity or uh, is, comes from different sources, such as food or the endogenous pathway, from microbes, xenobiotics, but also from metabolites that can uh, are involved in damage repair processes. Here I, you can see the workflow that is mainly used in metabolomics studies. It consists of the sample preparation, sample analysis, data acquisition, data processing, and compound identification. And each of them is a, a critical step. In the first case, we have the sample preparation. And as the nature of these metabolites is really diverse, we need to select in advance which kind of compounds we want to analyze. Polar metabolites, non-polar metabolites, a single class, but also we need to select the extraction technique because we can have a solid or we can have a solid, a solid or a liquid sample. So we will use liquid liquid extraction, solid phase extraction. We need also to select the extraction solvent because of the polarity of this solvent. The most used are methanol or acetonitrile, but also isopropanol or chloroform can be used. And another aspect to take into account is the resuspension solvent because even though we can extract compounds from a matrix or for a food, we need to be sure that those compounds are also soluble in the mobile phase that we are using or the, the solvent we are using to inject the samples into the separation system. So as you can see in this slide, there is no a single method that can cover the full metabolome. So based on the polarity, we can have all these solvents, but also a mixture of them. And you can see that none of them can cover all the metabolome. The metabolome. So we need to select in advance what we want to observe or to measure before doing it. After sample preparation, we need the sample analysis. We have the sample analysis. And nuclear magnetic resonance and mass spectrometry are the most used techniques in metabolomics, being mass spectrometry the most used. It is, that is because uh, it allows the, the wide range of concentration from nanomolar to picomolar, and also a high throughput analysis with more uh, up to 1,000 metabolites. And both techniques allow the definition with gas chromatography, liquid chromatography, papillary electrophoresis, or um, um, the combination of several of them, like liquid, liquid chromatography coupled to liquid chromatography. This separation technique has different um, characteristics. For instance, GCMS is, uh, is characterized by a higher separation capacity and high reproducibility. 
and allow the uh, analysis of low molecular weight compounds and volatile organic compounds. In the case of liquid chromatography, it allows the analysis of high molecular weight and polarity compounds and is the most often used uh, technique in metabolomics. You can see here in the slide the proportion of studies using LCMS compared to GCMS, but also we need to take into account the ionization technique used. So for instance, for GC, most of the, the, the works have been done using electron impact ionization, but also chemical ionization can be used. And for LCMS, most of the studies have been used uh, using, uh, have been, an, uh, have used electrospray ionization, but also APCI or APPI can be used. So there's also, uh, there's always a compromise from the starting point, the sample preparation until the analysis of which kind of compounds we can detect in our, in, in our analysis. But furthermore, we have, uh, for instance, in HPLC, we can select different stationary phases. The most used is the reverse phase, which allows the analysis of medium polar and non-polar metabolites, such as triacylglycerols. But also we can use hydrophilic interaction chromatography with which allow the analysis of very polar metabolites such, such as amino acids or sugars. So there is a bunch of mm, combinations that we can, we can select to perform a metabolomics study. Metabolomics as well as proteomics and transcriptomics requires a lot of, uh, a lot of data processing and bioinformatics tools. First for peak deconvolution, isotoping, peak alignment and annotation, and for the comparison of the uh, isotopic profile and fragmentation patterns with data stored in metabolic, in metabolic databases. The two most used uh, platforms of softwares are XCMS and MZMine, which you can see here, they have more than, in some cases, more than 1,000 citations. They are both free access, but in the last years, other tools uh, have been developed, such as MS Dial. I mentioned this software because it was developed in the lab, in the laboratory where I was in the USA, and it's quite easy to use and it's free access. And uh, I have used it quite uh, often and it works uh, great. But together with these tools, we have also mass spectral libraries, the same as for transcriptomics and metabolomics. These are some of the biggest ones, the Human Metabolome Database, or NIST, Medlin, and the Mass Bank of, of North America. And here you can see the amount of data that we can compare with. In Medlin, we have more than half million molecular standards with uh, MSMS data in positive and negative modes. In NIST 20, it was released last year with 1.3 million spectra, MSMS spectra from more than 21,000 compounds, or the Bass Bank of North America with more than 690,000 spectra, both from in silico and experimental data. So these this, uh, databases can be used with specific softwares to compare or experimental data, experimental exact mass and experimental MSMS with those contained in the lab in the library. And we can get a list with the different hits. So we can try to identify all compounds. However, uh, as there are more than 2 million or more compounds in the nature, non, not all of them are in the libraries or the databases. So in most cases, we don't get a good result. So we have several unknowns, maybe like 70% 70, 70 of all results are not known. So other tools have been developed for the interpretation of the spectra based on computational algorithms and quantum chemistry to try to identify the substructure and the structure and get a hint about the metabolite that we want to analyze. So all these massive um, techniques or that high throughput techniques um, need to be processed with bioinformatic tools to normalize the data or to do multivariate analysis, to do correlation analysis or to do univariate analysis. 
but also other specific tools have been developed for the interpretation and integration of all this data. For instance, the functional enrichment analysis allows to the analysis of classes of genes that are overrepresented in a set of genes or proteins. Causal analysis allows to reconstruct causal gene networks. Pathway analysis that uh, allow the identification of molecular uh, of segments of the molecular physiology machine machinery. And more specific for metabolomics, this Cambridge analysis that allowed the chemical similarity enrichment between the compounds that have been identified. So taking into account all these um, techniques and softwares, we can use them to, do, uh, to characterize food. And in the case of food authenticity, it, they have been quite um, often used. You can see here that the number of published work focused on food authentication has grown exponentially from since 2000, with in the last two years with more than 800 publications. Being molecular and chromatographic uh, methods, the major approaches used for food authentication. Also, you can see here isotopic, which is connected to the previous talk. In, in, you can see also here the trend of molecular and chromatographic uh, techniques that have increased from 2000. So these tools, they are, uh, I mean, quite often used. So I have also collected some information about the studies um, of, of the main products uh, analyzed for, for, for authentication purposes. And you can see that meat, seafood, dairy products, plant origin, genetically modified organisms, wine, honey, and others such as saffron or coffee are the most frequently analyzed. And you can see here that genomics, proteomics, and metabolomics have been used, for instance, for the detection of species in meat mixtures or for the detection of poor meat adulteration using next generation sequencing, but also proteomics to detect different kinds of meat in food products or for the species identification based on the uh, metabolomic fingerprint. In the case of seafood, genomics have been used for the identification of mollusks and fish species or for the, or for the identification of seafood species in Surimi to, to avoid uh, allergic uh, reactions. So people need to know which is the composition of of these surimi products. Also, proteomics have, has been used for the determination of different species or the differentiation of wild and farm fish. In the case of dairy products, several methods have been developed for the detection of cow milk in adulteration in buffalo milk or the detection of different milk in cheese, as well as for the identification of thermal treatment in milk or for the, or the authentication of protected designation of origin using, for instance, GCMS with principal component analysis. In the case of plant origin, genomics has been used for the authentication of seven carry species using DNA barcoding, or metabolomics has been used for the characterization or separation between organic and conventional products or to study saffron authenticity and, an, and adulteration based on liquid chromatographic coupled to mass spectrometry. In the case of GM, GMOs, uh, they have been uh, quite uh, well studied to identify genetically modified, the genetically modified genes or to compare the expression of different proteins between two conditions in genetically modified mice compared to the non-genetically modified. Or for instance, in wine, uh, genomics has been used for the assessment on, of wine authenticity or the discrimination of different Croatian wines and the determination of the geographical origin. So in conclusion, genomics, transcriptomics and proteomics and metabolomics tools represent a promising alternative to classical food analysis because of their sensitivity, high throughput, multiplexing, robustness, and discriminating power. And the tools such as net generation sequencing, PCR, nuclear magnetic resonance, and mass spectrometry 
have already demonstrated to be appropriate for assessing the main topics related to food authentication, such as species authentication, origin determination, addition of non-declared ingredients, production method authentication, or GMO detection. Thank you very much for your attention. Oh dear, Alberto, thank you very much for this very inspiring talk, uh, very broad uh, topics and very broad strategies. Um, I was wondering about, um, do you also work on data fusion? So data to bring fusion. data fusion, so to bring together data from different disciplines. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes, together, my, together, better resolved picture at the end. Yes, my main aim, well, the, my main line of invest, investigation is uh, involves the analysis of bioactive compounds, and we not just food, but how this food affect uh, health or different systems. In the case of Alzheimer's disease, for instance, so we try to connect protein expression and. Transcript or transcriptomics with metabolomics. So we try to connect both, but that is a, the biggest problem right now because sometimes in transcriptomics you can get, you can, you have the expression of the whole transcriptome. And in proteomics, you have maybe 1000 proteins. However, in metabolomics, maybe you can identify a few hundred or maybe 150 metabolites. So the starting from 20,000 or going to 1,000 and then going to 150, it, mm, it, it is not balanced. So it's quite difficult, quite difficult, but we have found some interesting relations. So, But would it be 